Hello, uh, my name is uh, Christopher Poor, and I'm uh, one of the seminarians at St. Paul's K Street here in DC. And uh, tonight we are very excited to have a talk by Dr. John Orens. Um, he, of course, uh, received his doctorate from Columbia University in 1976, and he is now a professor of European history um, at uh, George Mason. And uh, his book is Stuart Headlam's Radical Anglicanism. Um, we're very excited to have him talk tonight about another uh, wonderful Anglo-Catholic named Percy Dearmer. Um, and before I hand it over to you, Dr. Orns, uh, as is our custom, we'll, we'll pray the, the collect for this week. Does that sound good to everybody? Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, who see us that we have no power of ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault us the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, Christopher, will you allow me to um, share my screen? Can you do that? Um, I think that, uh, yes, we should be able to do that. And where is that link here? Oh, I see it. I see it. All right. There we go. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Christopher. Uh, thank you for uh, putting this forum together. And um for all that you have done and uh, will continue to do for, for us. Um, anyone who has uh, visited our apartment, and I think some of you have, uh, will know that um, our interior decor consists primarily of books, miles and miles of books, uh, weighty tomes, biblical commentaries, works on theology, history reference books. But there is one book to which I return again and again. Um, and um, here it is. The Porcine History of Philosophy and Religion. Uh, and in, did you need to show your screen? Are we supposed to be seeing something right now? Yes, you are supposed to be, but aren't you? Ah, let me see what I can do about this. Share screen. Um, ah, here we go. All right, how's that? Good. A Porcine History of Philosophy and Religion. Um, and this is a book I commend to all of you, especially to you, Christopher, as you think about your doctoral studies coming up. Um, you'll find in this porcine history all sorts of wonderful pigs. There are Aristotelian pigs, there are Kantian pigs, there are Hegelian pigs, there are French existentialist pigs, and loads of Christian pigs, Baptist pigs, Methodist pigs. But my favorite pigs are, of course, the Anglican pigs. And I'm particularly fond, whoops, what is happening here? Uh, let's see if I can move this. I don't think that I can get to the next slide. Ah, this is very awkward. Hold on just a second. Let's see what we can do about this. Hmm. Let's see. Let's move all sorts of things. Let's try this again. Is this visible now? Yes, let's try again. No, it doesn't want to move. Somehow or other, my slides don't work well here. And I wonder what has happened. My wife is going to intervene. This never happens to anyone else, does it? 
this is a, it's actually very important for an Anglo Catholic to never be too good at this Zoom stuff, you know. <laughs> this is going really perfectly, actually. Ah, for some reason, there's the slide. There we are. Maybe if I press play. All right, here we are now. Here is my one of my favorite pigs. There's our Anglican pig, that jolly little pig following the Via Media. Now, this may seem like um, an odd model for Anglo-Catholics like ourselves, especially during Lent. I mean, it's hard to imagine a tractarian riding a tricycle. Um, but the Catholic revival uh, soon escaped the rigors of Tractarian austerity. And as many of you know, once it left the confines of Oxford University, it exploded into a kind of pastoral and liturgical exuberance, especially in the slums. And by the end of the 19th century, um, this exuberance had reached something of a fever pitch as Anglo-Catholics married their pastoral care to sacramental worship and sacramental worship to the struggle for justice and to a sacramental celebration of beauty itself. And no one did more. No one did more to consecrate uh, this union of worship, beauty, and justice than did Percy Dermer. Now, Dermer was born in 1867. His father, was a bank clerk who had the good sense to uh, leave banking and become an artist. Um, unfortunately, he did not have the same sense when it came to his marriage. Um, Caroline Dermer um, had founded a private school for girls, and by all accounts, she was very competent, but she was a very stern woman indeed and an evangelical of the strictest sort. Uh, she does not seem to have liked Percy from the beginning, perhaps because he was a dreamy child and shared his, his father's artistic temperament. And when Percy's father died at the age of 10, um, she neglected Percy as much as she possibly could. Um, and it was only by accident, really, it seems, um, that he uh, went up to Oxford in 1886 um, to read history at uh, Christ Church. He arrived in Oxford an ardent Tory. He would leave a socialist. He arrived without strong religious convictions. He would leave an Anglo-Catholic. He arrived attend intending to, to be a, an architect, and he would leave as a candidate for holy orders. Uh, that is what a university education can do to you. Um, his socialism, he learned from this man, um, a man named York Powell, a charismatic lecturer um, at Christ Church, an avowed pagan, and an admirer not of Karl Marx, but of John Ruskin and William Morris. Uh, York Powell preached a kind of aesthetic and moral socialism, a socialism that glorified the dignity of labor, that spoke about the dignity of the craftsman and about the necessity of beauty. As for his religion, um, Dermer picked up his high church leanings from um, this man, Thomas Banks Strong, um, an extraordinarily popular and a very, very eccentric lecturer in theology, also at Christ Church, um, who delighted in the friendship of Christ Church undergraduates. And this must have meant a great deal to young Percy, who was very, very shy. And uh, as you can see from this portrait, um, Thomas Banks Strong went on to better and higher things. He became the Dean of Christ Church, then the Bishop of Ripon, and finally, the Bishop of Oxford. But what really sealed Percy Dermer's fate was his encounter with the man who embodied both Catholicism and socialism, and that is Charles Gore. Now today, uh, 
Gore is largely remembered um, as the editor and contributor of this book, Lux Mundi. And notice, notice the title, A Series of Studies in the Religion of the Incarnation. And what Gore offered was a kind of earthy, incarnational theology that freed Anglo-Catholicism from um, what we might call the incubus of biblical literalism and inspired a whole generation of young Anglo-Catholics to take up the cause of social reform. Gore at the time that uh, Percy Durham met him was also the principal of Pusey House, which we can describe, I think, as the nerve center of the Anglo-Catholic universe at the time. In other words, Percy Dermer arrived at Oxford and his world was turned upside down and he couldn't have been happier. He wrote later on, I know perfectly well why I became a Christian. It was because I felt the world is extremely beautiful, but eminently unsatisfactory. And so he set himself the task of joining his fellow Anglo-Catholics in turning the rest of the world right side up. So what did he do? Well, when Charles Gore and members of his circle created the Christian Social Union to take up the cause of the poor, Percy Dermer signed up. And that was not all. Even before that, he had joined the far more radical and far more openly Catholic Guild of St. Matthew, led by this most bohemian of Anglo-Catholics, a man many of you are familiar with, Stuart Hedlund, who was also the founder of, as you can see, the Church and Stage Guild, which, among other things, championed uh, the music hall ballet in which young women cavorted about in flesh-colored tights. Percy Dermer must have delighted in this. What we do know is that a few years later, when Stuart Hedlund founded the even more outrageous anti-Puritan league, Percy Dermer was one of the first people to sign up along with his friend, Conrad Noel. Talk about exuberance. Now, by this time, Percy Dermer had decided to pursue ordination. This, by the way, um, um, drove his mother um, crazy. Um, she was so furious that she cut him off from any further financial support. And if Charles Gore had not taken him under his wing, heaven knows what would have happened to him. But he faced another challenge. Here he is, this exuberant, over-the-top Anglo-Catholic, and exuberance of this sort was not what the Church of England was looking for in prospective ordinance. Exuberance of this sort is not what the Church is looking for even, even now, as some of us know um, all too well. Uh, but somehow or other, somehow or other, Percy managed to get ordained, and he obtained a cure in what may have been one of the very few parishes that would have been willing to take him on. That was the slum parish of St. Anne in South Lambeth. And the vicar of that parish was a man named William A. Morris, known to his parishioners as Brother Bob, a man who, um, whose ministry is one of those legends um, that make up the heroic chapter in the history of the Anglo-Catholic movement. It seemed an ideal match. And this was not the only ideal match, because in addition to managing to find a parish, Percy Dermer found a wife. Her name was Mabel, Mabel White. And Mabel White was a young woman who had begun a career as an illustrator and author of children's books. She would later go on to write a whole host of novels, to produce plays. Um, and she was, at the time that Percy Dermer met her, also a very, very radical socialist and a feminist. Now, it was a marriage of which Percy Dermer's mother did not approve. 
It was a marriage that Mabel Dermer's parents did not approve. And once again, Charles Gore had to intervene or else the marriage probably wouldn't have taken place. And so the newlyweds settled in to a cottage opposite the church. Um, they were very poor. Uh, there are reports of people who visited them that this little cottage was covered with William Morris style fabrics, William Morris style wallpaper, but lacked any furniture. At least no one saw any furniture. Uh, they were very poor and they were very happy. But although Percy Dermer uh, loved his parishioners and cared deeply for them, um, his shyness um, made it difficult for him to minister to them. And he was so involved in his work for the Christian Social Union, for the Guild of St. Matthew, and also as a member of the Fabian Society, um, that in the end, um, Brother Bob had to go to the bishop and say, this isn't working. I love this fellow, but it just isn't working. And he had to let Percy go. So what happened next? Well, four curacies followed in fairly rapid succession. The last of them at this place, this rather ugly Victorian hulk, the Church of St. Mark on Marleyvin Street. Now, at the time that Percy went there, it was a center of what was called advanced ritual. In other words, Roman ceremonial. Today, well, look at the notice board. Things are very different. How are the mighty fallen? Um, now, because the vicar was often ill, um, Percy had the opportunity to tinker with it. It, it was not to his liking. Um, um, but tinkering was all that he could do. What he wanted to do was far more radical than that. And he made it clear in his most famous, his most influential, and his most misunderstood book, a book called The Parsons Handbook a book that would undergo 12 revisions during Percy's lifetime and then would be revised yet again after his death. Now, what is the Parsons Handbook all about? Well, at first sight, it seems like the work of someone who is obsessively fastidious. Um, it is a guide to church uh, ceremonial that dictates everything everything down, down to the last inch. How long should a surplus be? How wide should a tippet be? Uh, one critic um, I came across recently uh, described it as the Emily Post Guide to Worship. Uh, but it's really nothing of the sort. Because what Percy Dermer was about were three urgent goals. The first was that, that he wanted to end the liturgical warfare that was tearing the Church of England apart and the whole Anglican world as well. Evangelicals were insisting on a worship that was denuded of ceremony, light, and joy, and they were busy harassing Anglo-Catholics. Anglo-Catholics, out of the best of motives, responded by adopting ceremonies and prayers from uh, the Roman Rite that in Percy's mind had no place in Anglican worship. And what was even worse, Percy feared that by adopting these Roman ceremonies and Roman prayers, what these Anglo-Catholic clergy were doing was admitting that the evangelicals were right and that the Church of England wasn't really Catholic at all. So what was the answer? Well, the answer, he said, was strict fidelity to the prayer book rubrics. And if you read the prayer book rubrics, you would see that the worship of the Church of England should be conducted as it was in the late Middle Ages, just when the prayer book was first adopted. Notice um, this illustration, this front piece to uh, uh, the Parsons Handbook. 
there is this simple yet beautifully arrayed altar. And notice what it says underneath, a quotation from the prayer book rubrics. And the chancels shall remain as they have in times past. But Dermer wasn't simply pleading for history and good order. He was pleading for beauty. In calling for the church to be decorated in this lovely, restrained way, um, in calling for the church to return to the pattern of the pre Reformation church and to return to the vestments of the pre Reformation church, what Dermer was doing was summoning Anglicans to experience God in the fullness of incarnate sacramental splendor. Notice what he says here. Beauty is necessary to a right life as truth is. A worship that is aesthetically bad is an idolatry, since it is directed to an object that is not the supreme artist of the world. Or as he put it up elsewhere, he said, we are embodied creatures. And it is only through the outward beauty of symbol and color that our inner life can grow and flourish. But then Dermer went on to insist that there is more to this beauty than we imagine. Because like all of God's gifts, it's not something to be grasped not something to be kept to ourselves as a kind of private enjoyment. It is intended for all men and women, especially, especially for those whose bodies are exploited and whose spirits are numbed by what Dermer regarded as a mammon-worshipping economic system. Dermer argued that ugly vestments and shoddy church furnishing was the outward and visible sign of inward and spiritual decay. And he put it this way in the, in the preface to uh, the first edition of the Parsons Handbook. He said, a modern preacher often stands in a sweated pulpit, wearing a sweated surplice, over a suit of clothes that were not produced under fair conditions and holding a sweated book in one hand. With the other, he points to the machine-made cross at the jerry-built altar and appeals to the sacred principles of mutual sacrifice and love. Or perhaps this will make it clearer. What is this? What, what do you see here? Is this an antiquarian pageant? It could be. Is it a display of ecclesiastical fashion? Maybe, but Dermer would say no. What you see here is a procession into the kingdom of God. This is a procession into a new order of things. Now, Dermer couldn't introduce this sort of ceremonial um, into St. Mark's, Marleybone Street, but in 1901, for reasons we don't understand how he managed this is a mystery, he was appointed vicar of St. Mary's from Rose Hill in North London. And once he was there, he lost little time in transforming the ceremonial, transforming the vestments, transforming the very fabric of the church. There it is to this day. There are those vestments. And notice, notice the chancel. Um, this is a red brick Victorian building. Percy Dermer, almost as soon as he arrived, whitewashed the chancel and then whitewashed the rest of the church in order to bring out um, 
the colors um, um, of the ornaments and vestments um, that um, he introduced there. It is an extraordinary thing. And that's not all that he did. Uh, because if beauty is there for the eye, Dermer believed it's also there for the ear. It is meant to be heard, and it is meant to be sung, and it is meant to be sung by the entire congregation. So, what did he do? Oops. We seem to have lost our... Hmm. We seem to have lost our slides again. And is there a collect, Christopher? For lost slides? <laughs> or or is, is there a petition in, in the great litany that we could add? Let me see what I, I, I can do here. Hold on. I do this? No. It simply does not. Let me see if I can get back. I do not seem to be able to get out of this at all. Oh, there we go. Ah, something happened. All right. So what does he do? He hires this man on the left, Martin Shaw, uh, to serve as the choir master and organist, the brilliant, brilliant um, organist, who up until this time was known primarily for his work um, on the stage. But there was more to do. You have a brilliant organist. You want people to sing. What are they going to sing? Well, the standard hymnal, the almost universal hymnal in the Church of England was hymns ancient and modern, and Percy Dermer could stand it. He thought the words were sentimental and pietistic. He thought the music was terribly treacly. And so he recruited a young composer named Ralph Vaughan Williams. And the two of them compiled a new hymnal, the English Hymnal in 1908. Now, the music is extraordinary. I mean, it's this hymnal that introduced some of our favorite hymn tunes, Sine Nomine for all the saints, uh, Down Ampne, Come Down, O Love Divine. And it also introduced texts. It had the character of a kind of theological manifesto, summoning the church to the work of social transformation. It's here that we find such familiar hymns, Christian socialist hymns, as Judge Eternal, O God of Earth and Altar, and Percy Dermer's take on uh, John Bunyan, he who would valiant be. And there was also a notable excision. There's a lovely hymn, we all know it, All Things Bright and Beautiful. And there is a stanza in that hymn that Percy Dermer removed. And it's the stanza that goes, the rich man in his castle the poor man at his gate, God made them high and lowly and ordered their estate. Dermer would have none of that. Now, this hymnal won wide acclaim, especially from Anglo-Catholics, but there were complaints. If the evangelical Bishop of Bristol was particularly worked up because one of the hymns that was introduced is a hymn that's a favorite of ours, a Marian hymn, you all know it, Ye Who own the faith of Jesus. And the Bishop of Bristol was much offended by this line, for the faithful gone before us, may the Holy Virgin pray. And the Bishop said, this, this is asking for the intercession of the saints, and, and this is just unacceptable. To which Percy Dermer replied, well, does the Bishop think that we should sing in said, instead for the faithful gone before us, May the Holy Virgin not pray. On this, he would not budge. So we have sacraments, we have socialism, we've got music, 
we've got liturgy, and you would think that Percy Dermer would be done, but there was another incarnational bee in his bonnet. At the turn of the last century, like, like today in many ways, in Britain and the United States and much of the Western world, there were all sorts of churches and sects and movements offering the promise of spiritual healing, Christian science, new thought, theosophy. And most proper church folk dismissed all of these calls for spiritual healing as idle superstition, but not Percy Dermer. He said only someone, only someone who does not understand the incarnation, only a materialist who doesn't understand the sacramental nature of the human body, only such a person could fail to see that spiritual healing is an essential ministry of the church. It is the failure of the church, he said, it is the failure of the church to embrace this ministry that has opened up the door to Christian science and all these other movements. And so what did he do? Well, he and his friend, Conrad Noel, founded what they called the Guild of Health, now known as the Guild of Health and St. Raphael. And notice, notice how profoundly Catholic and sacramental its principles are. Dermer said, regarded technically as a Christian ordinance, sacramentalism may be confined to those vehicles of grace ordained by Christ, the seven sacraments. Regarded universally, sacramentalism is the answer to the riddle of the universe. Every birth is a microcosm of the incarnation, and every body a little word of God made flesh. And so, and so, the intersection of the spiritual and the physical is an inevitable part of our faith. This was not a call for people to abandon medical science, but rather to join medical science to the undoubted reality of God's healing presence. So, all seemed to be going well for Percy Dermer. He was controversial, but widely acclaimed. The parish was flourishing. It was attracting a colorful and rather bohemian congregation. There were artists, there were writers, there were musicians, there were sandal-wearing vegetarians. Um, uh, not many lawyers, I have to confess. Um, um, and uh, among these um, um, bohemians, well, were this woman on the left, Maud Royden, a um, Anglo-Catholic feminist about whom I'll say something in a little bit. And well, there was Conrad Noel, as bohemian a priest as you could find, uh, who uh, Percy Dermer took on as his curate, and um, who would later take all he learned from Primrose Hill uh, uh, to uh, the legendary parish of Thaxted. But Dermer himself was growing weary, weary um, of, uh, well, of a decade of ministry in one place, uh, weary of the struggle to awaken the church, weary in particular of, of, of his inability to get many of his fellow Anglo-Catholics uh, to understand the sensuous and sacramental um, and social vision that he believed lay at the heart of their faith. He said, said, our doctrines are true, our doctrines are true, but we have allowed them to obscure the God to whom they point. Uh, we have made our doctrines an idol, and we miss what they are trying to tell us, that God is love and light and life. So is it any wonder, he said, any wonder, that people who are looking for guidance and people who are looking for inspiration don't seek it from their parish church. We've failed them. We've failed them. And then in the midst of this frustration came the First World War. Now, although Mabel Dermer 
was um, a pacifist. Um, Percy and Mabel's two sons, Christopher and Jeffrey, um, quickly decided um, to enlist. And a few months later, Percy uh, himself, who was looking for a way out uh, from St. Mary's, um, decided to take leave of the parish and to serve as a volunteer chaplain to soldiers serving in Serbia. Um, and um, he did this without telling his wife. And she discovered it. There was, there was a service um, at St. Martin in the field um, uh, to uh, bring attention to the war in Serbia. Percy was the preacher and Mabel sitting there in the congregation hears from the pulpit that Percy had decided to go to Serbia. Uh, and what did she do? Well, being the remarkable woman she was, um, she didn't complain. Instead, right then and there, she signed up to go to Serbia as well and to serve um, as a nursing assistant. Um, it was all characteristically gallant, all characteristically reckless, and it would all end in tragedy. Not long after they arrived, uh, Mabel died of typhus. Percy was shattered and returned home only to learn soon later, soon after, that Christopher had been killed at Gallipoli. In January of 1916, he resigned as vicar of Primrose Hill. Now, a few years before, Mabel had translated a poem of uh, Paul Verlaine's uh, The Sky Above the Roof that Vaughan Williams set to music. It is beautiful and it is heartbreaking. And to listen to it, and it is available um, on YouTube, is, I think, to pay tribute to this remarkable woman and to all of the lives lost in that war. Um, and perhaps one day someone will sing it at St. Paul's. But what lay ahead for Percy Dermer? Well, he had left his parish and he accepted an offer from the YMCA to uh, give a series of lectures to troops in France and then to give a series of lectures in India. And with this, Percy Dermer's world was about to be turned upside down again. Because in France, he discovered, as, as did other Anglican clergy, that the differences between church parties and the differences between different churches meant nothing to soldiers facing death on the battlefield. And Dermer became convinced that for all of their errors, Protestant nonconformists had much to teach the Catholic Church, not least the uncomfortable truth that the church is a channel for divine grace and not simply a channel for holy orders. And in India, he became clear, keenly aware that divine grace flowed even more widely than the Christian church. Uh, now, by the time he arrived in India, he had married again, married a woman named Nancy Knowles, woman known as Nan, uh, uh, and a, a woman who years ago, uh, Percy Dermer had uh, prepared for confirmation at uh, Primrose Hill. Uh, he was 44, she was 27. And when the work in um, India was done, uh, there were no offers in England, so off they went. Uh, to the Berkeley Divinity School, which was located at that time in Middletown, Connecticut, um, where uh, Percy accepted a one-year position as a professor of liturgics and theology. And there he continued his campaign against slovenly worship, bad music, 
and the narrow mindedness that he believed was driving ordinary people out of the church. Um, and um, I seem to have lost my place. Hold on just a moment. There is a note here of some sort, I hope. Or I can simply make it up. Ah, here we go. Ah, I didn't want to miss this. He told the students at Berkeley Divinity School, burn your hymnals. Burn them. Burn them all. And if they give you new hymnals, burn them as well. <laughs> you have to start afresh. Now, this wasn't a call to abandon the church. Uh, it, was a, it was a cry for passion and for purpose. He said, I do so love the Church of England so much. If only she would come down from her pedestal, down from her thrones and palaces and laid her jewels at the feet of the poor. Now, not surprisingly, when Percy returned to England in 1919, no parish or cathedral was interested in him. To many Anglo-Catholics, he was too liberal. To evangelicals, he was too Catholic. To broad church modernists, he was too mystical, too artistic, and too liturgical. There was no place for him in the church. But there was outside. Two places, in fact. First, King's College London. He had a friend there who persuaded the board to appoint him the college's first professor of ecclesiastical art, a post, I should point out, that carried with it the ample salary of 50 pounds a year. Fortunately, um, Nan came from a wealthy family, so she and Percy were able to live rather comfortably. Um, as for Percy's teaching, well, it went on very well indeed. Some of his lectures, in fact, were open to the general public, and they proved to be so popular that they had to be moved to a larger and then to a larger lecture hall. And before long, he was being asked to serve not only as professor of ecclesiastical art, but professor of medieval and um, classical art as well. But then there's this second place. Now, now, now remember Maud Royden. Remember Primrose Hill. Well, Maud Royden was an extraordinarily gifted woman, and women in those days were not allowed to teach in the church sanctuary, let alone preach. And so although she was a faithful um, Anglican, Maud Royden took a position as a lay minister at the Congregational City Temple in London, which you could describe as the cathedral of Protestant nonconformity. But then the senior minister who hired her retired. Maud Royden had no place to go. And Percy Dermer suggested to her that she, well, that she go out on her own, take on a ministry that was all her own. A ministry that would not only open the door to the ministry of women across the church, a cause that was very close to Dermer's heart, but a ministry that would reach those multitudes of people who had abandoned the church or had never been part of the church. And so was born what was called the Guild Hall. It was not a church. It had no services on Sunday morning. The Eucharist was not celebrated there, but it was for Royden and for Dermer an entryway, as it were to the church. There were prayers, there were lectures, there were concerts, there were sermons, uh, most often given by Maud Royden herself, some of them given by Percy Dermer, and of course there were hymns again. Hymns chosen and arranged by Percy Dermer's old choir master and friend Martin Shaw, and also arranged by Cecil Sharp, Britain's most prolific champion of English folk music. Uh, so Dermer accomplished much during these years. Um, in his effort to uh, bridge the gap between churches, 
Um, he joined with Vaughan Williams and Martin Shaw once again to produce yet another hymnal, uh, Songs of Praise. Um, not a book that was as successful as the English hymnal, but popular nonetheless, and it did give its name to what is today a very popular BBC TV show. Um, three years later, um, Dermer joined uh, Martin Shaw again to finish work on what is surely a much beloved work for many of us, the Oxford Book of Carols. But still, Dermer yearned, yearned for a parish, yearned for a place in the church, but still none could be found. At one point, uh, he went to the Bishop of London and suggested that he be given a responsibility for St. Martin in the field. But um, that parish was given to uh, another legendary figure, Dick Shepherd. Uh, then the bishop played with the idea, this is an interesting one, played with the idea of sending Percy Dermer to St. Paul's Knightsbridge, our sister parish. Now imagine what would have happened if Percy Dermer had ended up there, uh, but uh, the bishop changed his mind. Where Dermer did find something of a welcome was here, Holy Trinity Sloan Square, uh, the self-described Cathedral of the Arts and Crafts, um, an Anglo-Catholic parish um, um, that couldn't have been a more welcome setting for someone like Percy Dermer. But still he was frustrated, frustrated that the church didn't understand his sacramental vision of beauty, truth, and justice, frustrated that there was no permanent place for him in the church, um, frustrated that people just didn't get it. At one point, he, he, he blurted out, if only we showed the people the Eucharist better, we should need to talk about it much less. We have been given poetry in the text of our common worship, and we have used it as if it were prose. And finally, Finally, in 1931, he received some of the recognition that he was due. Pressure came from William Temple, who was then the Archbishop of York. Pressure came from a petition signed by all sorts of eminent clergy. Um, all of this went to the Labour Prime Minister of the day, Ramsay MacDonald. And in 1931, over the objections of the Dean of Westminster Abbey, Percy Durer became a canon of Westminster Abbey. Um, by all accounts, uh, his most important work was now done. He was a tired man and in failing health, but the passion and urgency never left him. Um, never left him until the day he died in 1936. And one of his last sermons, sermon he gave at Westminster Abbey, he said this. Um, he reported that the prime minister of Tibet had had his eyes plucked out uh, for failing to be um, um, as adequate an administrator as the authorities thought. And Dermer said, um, this gives one a thrill of horror. But why? What has Christianity done? Well, we don't put out people's eyes, except, of course, on mass production lines, the Great War, and so forth. Christianity has done something with us. He said, far worse things have happened than the blinding of this Tibetan minister. Millions were slain. Millions were slain in the Great War. During the last Whitsun holiday, 5,000 people were injured. We have not troubled to prevent it. We have allowed ugly suburban development. We deplore, but we do nothing. None of us have tried to make this country safe. 
the country is being taken from us. We lack a ministry of imagination. And then he said, you know, this is Hospital Sunday. This is Hospital Sunday. And we realize the need for hospitals, but to prevent disease perhaps requires too much of us. We must have vision. Otherwise, all Europe will be one vast hospital. And now, to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And he went back to his cannon stall. And a few years later, we know what happened to Europe. So what can we take from this story of Percy Dermer, this life? What can we say for ourselves? What does his life tell us about our worship, our music, our faith, our witness? I wouldn't dare answer those questions. They're too big. Let me conclude with some hints. First, let me draw your attention to a hymn. Um, a hymn by none other than Percy Dermer. And it is a Lenten hymn. And in the hymnal, it is hymn 145. I'd simply ask you to read it. What he says, among other things, is this. To bow the head in sackcloth and in ashes, or rend the soul, such grief is not Lent's goal. But to be led to where God's glory flashes, his beauty, to come near, make clear where truth and light appear. For is not this the fast that I have chosen, the prophet spoke, to shatter every yoke of wickedness? the grievous bands to loosen, oppression put to flight, till every wrong's set right. Then there's a poem. There's a poem by someone I'd never heard of before, an English priest who died recently named Hilary Greenwood. And it was used by uh, Martin Percy, the former Dean of Christ Church, in a sermon he gave to honor Percy Dermer. It's called What I Like About Being a Priest. What I like about being a priest is nothing to do with the cultic beast or having a message to write on the leaves or offering charms to the heart that grieves or counting the sheep in the pitch pine fold or wearing a shirt of cloth of gold. No, none of these, but marrying the glory of the little thing, the eavesdrop on a monologue delivered to a woolly dog to hear the tones of righteous rage excite the prophet of schoolboy age, to sit down on a bus behind four lots of fingers intertwined, to see the boy's face in the man's blush when he comes to put up the bands, to watch rheumatic ladies pat a blessing on the pampered cat. What I like about being a priest is turning everything to the East a sacramental calling. And it is, I would suggest, what Percy Dermer is ultimately talking about. And it is not something that is confined to the ordained clergy, but to us all. And finally, a single word. Uh, Christopher, when, when you gave your, your wonderful presentation, um, um, two weeks ago, you ended it with um, um, a, a very big question about beauty, about art. And there's a story about Percy Dermer. Um, he would have these at-homes and artists would come, um, actors, painters, sculptors. And on one evening, the subject was the ultimate meaning of art. What is the ultimate meaning of art? And as you can imagine, with a group like that, the conversation went on and on and on. This went on for hours. And at the end, 
there was a kind of awkward silence because nobody knew what to say. And Dermer looked up. He'd been quiet. He looked up and he said, love. There's one other thing Percy Dermer said. God wants us all to be happy. So maybe this little pig is a better Anglo-Catholic than we thought. And with that, I think I've said all, all that I can say, more than I ought to say. Uh, so thank you very much, Christopher, again, for this opportunity. And now I am trying to get rid of my share screen. Here we go. There we are. Thank you so much, Dr. Orens. Uh, as always, just like taking us into the deep questions and roots of our, of our wonderful tradition. So thank you so much. Um, I do want to give us a little time for people to have questions or comments or thoughts. Um, Please, please do, uh, you can use the raise hand feature or just uh, chime in. You know, we, what we lack in DC is a Dermorite parish. Yes. Um, now there was one, as you in, know, in Baltimore. Yes, that, that's exactly what I was going to say. There was a Dermorite parish in Baltimore, uh, St. John's in the village. Um, and it, it was a very, it, I think Percy Diemer would have enjoyed it. There was a, there was a very, very, very wealthy elderly lady who was a parishioner there, who was a great supporter of anything to do with Percy Diemer and the Parsons Handbook. And she, she funded it and they kept the liturgy to the letter as Diemer would have wanted it, um, including um, using incense in a thurible, but never swinging it. <laughs> they would carry the thurible out at the start and they would hang it on a stand at the front and they had beautiful um, watts, frontals, and vestments. And they even had um, a, a beadle who would, who would lead the procession wearing a, a, a three-point hat and a sort of wand. Um, we don't have anything like that in DC, but I've I've seen clips from that church in years gone by. the The old lady, the old lady passed, um, and she was she had told the church that she would pay for anything while she was um, while she was living, um, but she would not leave them a cent when she died out of fear that the diocese and specifically female clergy um, would, would somehow access her legacy. And she left it all to the Baltimore Museum of Art. And if you, if you go there today, there's a, a room named after her. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff Huell was there. Some of I you may it. remember him. Yes. Jeff Huell was there for a little while. Um, yes, he, he was. Um, church is and actually closing which is very sad yes um, I, I visited before Jeff right. Hume arrived there right. and I forgot who the rector was at the time Jesse Parker um, yes and and right. he oh he always spoke of Dr. Dermer with Dr. Dermer yes absolutely. And, and he, he would always nod his head absolutely so Dr. Dermer said and, and, and he could quote the rector could quote the Parsons handbook like holy scripture i think he had it memorized and you know when i was at saint stephen's house there were always a couple of people only a couple because most of us were more interested in things italian um but there would always be a couple who were obsessed with derma and would have these extraordinary surpluses um with with what you call smocking in them yes yeah, yeah, yeah. the amount of fabric that would be involved would be epic yeah. <laughs> make Christopher's surplus look tame, right? Oh, um, yes, yes. And, and for, for Dermer, this made an important social point. He, he complained right. that clergy who were orcatas yes. were, 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 were being cheap. Yes, that's what and, we were. And, and the, the more fabric you wore, the, 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 the more authentically socialist you were. 
one of my con- one of my contemporaries at St. Stephen's House could actually make smocked surpluses for people. He had a sewing machine and and I once saw the amount of fabric that was needed to make one of them, and it was enormous. <laughs> when he told me this this is just for one, um, my <laughs> Has anybody uh, been to St. Mary's Primrose Hill? It's it's well, we, I, know, I know that you'll have been, John. It, it if you're ever in London, it's well worth a visit. Um and um do they keep do they keep the DMRI liturgy alive, John? Or yeah, um, yeah, pre- pre- pretty much. Um um that they now I've seen um clips, I haven't been there recently, um, where um they're 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 facing the congregation. Uh-huh. Um, and I think they now use, oh goodness, what's the latest iteration? Common uh, worship. Co- co- common worship. Right. But the ceremony right. is, 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 is still very Dermorite. Um, it, 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 it is indeed well, well worth seeing. Did, did Dimmer say anything about North End celebrations? Would he, would he, have, he would have been an eastward facing. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely, right. yeah. When I when I was a curate in England, I had to learn how to celebrate at the North End, um, because when I would be covering in some very very small rural parishes, they would still have North End celebrations, which is something that none of you, other than perhaps John and Elizabeth, I have ever seen. <laughs> it's it's extraordinary. I've I've never seen it in an Anglican church. The only time I saw it was when Elizabeth was. Um, a graduate student at Drew University, which is a Methodist school. And there was a professor of uh, theology whose special interest was orthodoxy. Um, and he was a high church Methodist and he would celebrate the Eucharist in cassock and surplus standing at the North End. Right. Imagine if, if, if if you're trying to picture it, you know, we we face we celebrate facing east with our backs to the congregation. This is if you were standing at the at the far end of the altar, gazing across the altar lengthwise. <laughs> um, and you 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 have the cast, you have the chalice and pattern in front of you, but you really don't touch them. You sort of gesture at them like this. Well, you know, John Henry Newman right. celebrated that way. Right. To the very end. Right. Yes, that is what that is what the 1662 book says, standing at the north end, doesn't it? Um, it sure does. Um, I love how for you, Dr. Orange, the end for Newman is his conversion to Rome. Uh, <laughs> he, he turned uh, he turned east when he uh, yeah turned to Rome. I, I have a question uh, for you though. Um, you know, because you you pointed out that you know sort of sort of sad picture of that church where Dr. Um, Dermer had been that had the informal services, uh, you know, listed at eleven and at six. And the funny thing, it really struck me because you know, in um, you know, we have the Parsons Handbook. That's really that's the thing to go by. But there's also that book that came out um, in the twenties, I think, the Art of Public Worship, where uh, Dermer is talking about the potential. Yeah of the informal service. And it's just wild to me that this man held within his own life and in his own liturgical thought, both like what um, Anglo-Catholics would recognize as their heritage and like a very early fresh expressions approach that he thought these informal services would convert the masses back into a sacramental. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. How did he like, how did he hold all of that inside himself in one life? And like, does that give us any ideas of how to hold that within ourselves as a communion, as a denomination? Is there? Oh, I thought, you know, that's a, that's a good question, and I've I I think that I think that there was I don't think that Dermer held it together so much as there was a kind of a what you might call a dynamic tension. Um, I think that Dermer was seeking a way to draw people into the church. And he was open to all sorts of experiments, um, as long as as long as they were faithful to the heart of um, um, the liturgy, 
Um, and as long as they were not substitutes for the standard liturgy of the church. Um, and there were parts of the um, liturgy that, that we use um, that, that he rather would, would like to have seen go. Um, and he made two points which would make us uncomfortable, but I want to raise them because I think they're, they're, they're interesting. The first is um, he didn't like the weekly recitation of the general confession. And he didn't like it, not because he didn't agree with the words, but because, because he said it isn't real. People are saying things that they don't feel. Um, um, the remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. And how many people really believe that? Week after week or day after day. Better to do it monthly, he said when it really could mean something. He also, he also didn't like the recitation of the creeds. And um, the reason for that is he said, well, he said the creeds, reciting the creeds isn't an act of worship. And it involved people trying to make sense of metaphysical assertions that they didn't really understand. Now, I think that he went awry here, but the point that he was making, which is that worship needs to be real to people, I think is one that is worth pondering. When people come into the church, um, it should be something different from the everyday. It should be different but it should also be something that strikes them as real and as true. And so I think as the church looks at its worship, uh, those questions that Derma raised um, remain, uh, I think, important. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Orens. Is there maybe one, one last question uh, or comment? Just wanna give people space. Okay, go ahead, Deb. Yeah. I'd like to hear possibly uh, the rest of the story. What happened to his child or his children? All right. Well, we know that one of them died. That was um, Christopher. Jeffrey Dermer was a very gifted poet. And Jeffrey Dermer went on to the ripe old age of 101 and was the last surviving um, of the famous English war poets. His second marriage, um, he um, had two daughters from that marriage. And one of Percy Dermer's granddaughters was ordained not long ago as a priest, which I think would have thrilled uh, Percy Dermer no end. Wonderful. Well, um, thank you so much uh, for um, joining us, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Orange, for that wonderful talk. Um, next week, uh, we are joined by the um, the other uh, wonderful member of your family, Mother Orange, Mother Dr. Orange, uh, who will be uh, talking to us about Evelyn Underhill. And no, no, notice, notice, Christopher, that she outranks me now. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, same time, same place. And yeah, we're going to hear about one more Anglo-Catholic life uh, that will inspire us this Lent. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank Good, you. Night. Good night. Good night. Good night.